All right, welcome to the Plattsburgh House of Prayer. I am Pastor Jesse, if you don't know, and I'm glad that you're joining us this morning, especially you guys online joining us. So glad you're with us this morning. I want to read a scripture out of Colossians 1, verse 20. 27, it says, to them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Amen. We have an opportunity to celebrate the hope that we have, and that's Christ in us. So let's do that this morning. Let's stand. We're actually going to hear a little bit more about that today in the message. But coming off Thanksgiving week, let's keep it going. Let's have an attitude of gratitude, a thankfulness towards God and what he's done for us and what magnificent thing it is to have the hope of glory, Jesus Christ, inside of us. Amen. So let's worship the Lord this morning. Father God, we pray that you would pour out your presence like never before. God, that you would fill this place, that you would meet every hungry and thirsty heart this morning, and that we would encounter a real and living God. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. All right, let's worship the Lord this morning. Only king forever, Almighty God. 
the presence is here this morning. Holy Spirit is here this morning. Just ask that you would just, just close your eyes and, you know, we just had Thanksgiving and what a perfect time to just remember all the good things that God has done in our life. He's been so, so good to us. We're undeserving. But his grace is so, so sufficient. His love is unexplainable. <laughs> he is love. Just remember all the things that he's done and just say thank you to, to King Jesus. to slow down and just allow the presence of Jesus to just captivate you. Sometimes we need to slow down in this crazy world. <laughs> says, I lift my eyes to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord.
worship you. I worship you. You are here, moving in this place. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, turning lives around. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, working miracles. I worship you. I worship you. You are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are.
favorite part of the whole song. <laughs> I've never known a love like this before. I've never known a love like this before. I've never known a love like this before. Jesus, yeah. I've never known a love like this before. I've never known a love like this before. I've never known. God's all about. He wants to take his love from your head, from your head to your heart, to where it changes everything about you and everything in you, because that's what God does. He comes to restore, to redeem, to make new. Amen. And that's what God wants to do to you and for you this morning. Thank you, Jesus. If you're comfortable, if you can, you don't have to. Just raise your hands. got my elbow here but you know the when we raise our hands it's it's a symbol of one surrender it's also a symbol of worship because we're surrendering to the one we're raising our hands to you know and we, we do this at sporting events we do this at concerts but man we really should be doing this when we're in the presence of Jesus, yeah. when we're declaring the beauty and the majesty of Jesus Christ, there's something about when our hands go up and we worship and we surrender at the same time. And it's in that surrendering that faith is put into action. 
and this thing we know about Jesus, this, this everlasting love we know about him, this, this uh, transforming power of Jesus that we, we hear about and we see throughout the word and even in people's lives when we raise up our hands and we surrender in the place of worship. It goes from our head to our heart. And this morning, Jesus, I pray with raised hands. God, that this would go from our head to our heart this morning. And it would touch us and awaken us and change us, God. All because of faith going from our head to our heart this morning. So come, Holy Spirit. Father, there's people in here that's been just wanting to raise their hands to you. Wanting to get this stuff that I know and I want it in my heart. God, let today be the, the beginning of that, Lord. That I stop knowing, start living everything that you've done for me, Jesus, and everything that you've taught us. So come, Holy Spirit. Cause us to come alive in our heart this morning. And we know you do that. Because you receive surrender and a contrite spirit. So come, Holy Spirit, have your way in our lives this morning. Let it kick off this Christmas season by surrender and worship. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Praise the Lord. You can put down your hands. You may be seated. I love church. Because when I, I come, I, I don't come just to, just to sing words on a screen or hear someone speak. Especially me, because I'm not that good. <laughs> but I come to encounter a real and living God. Amen. And I, and I love moments where we can just take and, and just allow God to just reach deep into the recesses of our heart and really just have a, a moment of impact, right? One of the things we say here is one moment with Jesus change everything. See, look at that. <laughs> Let Jesus change you today. Amen. Praise the Lord. All right. So we're going to get into the message series that I've been doing uh, oh, uh, for the last handful of weeks. But before I do, I do have some announcements, and I wrote them down so I don't forget them. If you've been with us any length of time, you know I need them written down. <laughs> All right. So we do have BASIC this Monday at 7. Uh, BASIC is our student ministry, our ministry, college student ministry, I should say. Uh, they'll be meeting uh, Monday at 7. Uh, so if you're a college student, know a college student. If you're watching online and you're a college student, come on out. Uh, to the Plattsburgh House of Prayer tomorrow, Monday night at 7. I know they're going to have a great time. Every time I've uh, showed up, I always have a good time, so I imagine you will too. Uh, so come on out uh, for that basic group. We also will be having our youth group this Wednesday. So we didn't have it last week, but we'll be having it this week, this Wednesday, uh, again at 7 o'clock. So if your child is from the grades 6 through 12th, uh, they're welcome to come. We'd love to have them. Uh, we're going to have lots of fun, lots of games, and have a really good time. All right. The next thing I want to announce is we are going to be having a baptism next Sunday. Uh, amen. Yes. That's what we're all about, right? We, we talk about to know God, to find freedom, to discover your purpose, and make a difference. And these are all kind of steps along our journey with God, and, and we're in there somewhere. And one of those next steps for, for believers is that place of baptism, right? water baptism. So we're going to be having that next week. We do have a couple people that are signed up, actually a few people signed up for that. And if you are interested in water baptism uh, and doing that next Sunday, come see me after the service and we can add you to that list. Uh, definitely the more the merrier. We want to celebrate what God is doing in your live, lives and what he's going to continue to do. Amen. All right. And last but not least, there is a Christmas concert with uh, David Pettigrew, uh, December 15th. Uh, I, it's, I just, I actually can't wait for this. Uh, I get to come and just 
let him do most of the work, and I just get to sit in the presence of Jesus and celebrate what Christ has done. Amen. Uh, so I'm excited for this. Uh, come on out. Bring your families. We do plan on having a nice hot cocoa bar, so it'll be a great time of fellowship and just enjoying the season. Amen. So uh, mark your calendars. That is December 15th at 7 p.m. All right. I think that's all I'm going to do for announcements. I do need water. Had way too much gravy this week. Anybody, anybody here have way too much gravy? Yeah. Yeah. We do this icebreaker, and I say, what's your favorite part of Thanksgiving? Like, what's your favorite dish? And I'm surprised no one picks my favorite, and that's gravy. <laughs> right? I mean, gravy goes on everything. The turkey, the potatoes, the stuffing. I mean, what would it be without gravy, right? <laughs> so praise the Lord. <laughs> but I am a little dehydrated because I had four quarts of gravy over the <laughs> last couple of days. So, <laughs> all right. Praise the Lord. I hope you had a great Thanksgiving. I hope you were able to enjoy time with friends and family and, and really uh, allow yourself to be blessed uh, where God has you right now. And some of you are in a difficult place. Some of you are in a great place. But I know we can find the Lord in any place that we're at. Because the word of God is very clear. He doesn't leave us nor forsake us. In fact, he's here with us. He's our comforter. And that's kind of what we've been talking about, right? Uh, the, the helper, the Holy Spirit, one that was sent to, to help us, to give us comfort in our time of need. And no matter where you're at, you can be thankful for what the Lord is doing and has done in your life. And even where he's going to bring you. Some of you might be in a very tough season right now. And I, I want to remind you that seasons are called seasons for a reason because they end at some point and a new one begins. Amen. Uh, so just uh, be thankful that the Holy Spirit is with you and no matter what season you're in, knowing that God always has uh, more to come for you. Amen. Praise the Lord. All right. So let's pray real quick and then we'll jump into the message series that we've been doing. Father God, I just thank you for your presence here today. I thank you that you see every raised hand, Lord, and even those that might not have been raised, God, you see the heart and you see surrender. You see the, the longing to worship and the longing to surrender, God, and I pray that you would meet us with grace in that place. And God, as we look to your word this morning and as we learn more about your Holy Spirit, God, I pray that you would excite us, that you would ignite us, that you would set us on fire. I mean, that we would just burn bright for Jesus Christ and, and who you created us to be, Lord. Father, I pray that your word would, would take root, not in our mind, but in our heart. And that we would leave different than when we came in, all because of the work of your Holy Spirit. Father, I pray that you would pour out a spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of Jesus Christ, that the eyes of our heart would be enlightened to the hope to which you have called us. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. All right, so we've been doing a series called Hello, Holy Spirit, right? And I think it's, this is actually part five, so if you've missed the first four parts, I encourage you to go to our, our uh, website or even our Facebook page, and you'll be able to find these videos or the uh, iPod, uh, podcast, and you'll be able to listen or watch and, and learn and pick up some of the things that we've already discussed over the past four weeks. Amen? Now, I, I started this off by saying, if you pick up and read the book of Acts found in the Holy Scriptures, it won't take you long to begin to see a vibrant, overcoming, advancing church. How many here have read the book of Acts? Amen. It really should be called the Acts of the Holy Spirit uh, because we see his handprint all over the book of Acts. Now, my question is, what changed from Malachi or even from the Gospel of John? What changed from the Gospel of John to the book of Acts? Right? How were plain, ordinary, normal people able to turn the world upside down? Because that's what we see in the book of Acts. 
a vibrant, overcoming, advancing church that turns the world upside down. And it's really all due to someone Jesus referred to as the promise of the Father, the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 1, verses 4 and 5, and it reads this. It says, And while staying with them, he, being Jesus, ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father. You see, Jesus, he's about ready to be taken and to, to sit where he's meant to sit. And that's, that, that is at the right hand of the Father in heaven, in the throne room, right? So Jesus, he's about ready to depart, and he gives his disciples one last word of advice. And he says, do not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Too many people have resigned themselves to perpetual defeat in their battles with temptation or to stumble through life making decisions with nothing more than our own brokenness to kind of guide our next step. And that's not the life that Jesus intended for you. That's not the life that Jesus intended his, intended his follower, followers to live. In fact, Jesus said in John 10.10, 10, he says, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. So before he goes to sit at the right hand of the Father, Jesus tells his followers, don't go anywhere. Don't do anything until you meet the person of the Holy Spirit. You see, the dynamic full life that Jesus promised for you and me, that Jesus promised for his believers, is really the natural outgrowth of our intimate fellowship with the person of the Holy Spirit. God, the Holy Spirit, part of the Trinity. So we've been on a journey over the past few weeks to get a better understanding of the person of the Holy Spirit. Over the past four weeks, we've been looking at the, the person of the Holy Spirit as part of the Trinity. He's not a lackey. He's not an it. He's not a force. He's part of the Trinity. He's the person of the Holy Spirit. And we've been looking at his activity in creation. Even from the very beginning, we see the Holy Spirit part of that creation. And then we looked at the Holy Spirit and his activity throughout the Old Testament. And we saw through scriptures his connection to and even the activity with Jesus, the Messiah, the anointed one. From, from the moment he was conceived to his death and resurrection, we see and looked at the activity of the Holy Spirit in all of that. And last week, we talked about the Holy Spirit's role in, in what Jesus calls the ecclesia, the church. Right? And today, we're going to look at the Holy Spirit and you. The Holy Spirit and the believer. All right, so let's jump on in. There are three phases, not phrases, there are three phases of interaction that every believer has with the person of the Holy Spirit. And that interaction is the Holy Spirit with us, the Holy Spirit in us, and the Holy Spirit upon us. And we're going to start with the Holy Spirit with us. And with the Holy Spirit with us, it's really the work of salvation. The work of salvation. If you're taking notes, write that down or, or get a shot of the screen. The Holy Spirit with us, the work of salvation. You see, before we were ever part of God's family, the Holy Spirit was actively working in our hearts to bring us to the point where we would see our need to accept Jesus Christ as our Savior. You know, I remember talking with someone about evangelism and he was kind of saying, well, if you're talking with someone about Jesus Christ and they don't think they need a savior, it's like going to a pool party in a tuxedo. <laughs> it just doesn't make sense. Why do I need a savior? You see, Jesus Christ, our savior, the one that died on the cross, makes no sense until we recognize that we're all broken and that 
we can't save ourselves. There's nothing we can do to, 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 to swim and, and to get where we need to go when it comes to our divine create, uh, how God divinely created us. We need a savior, right? And before we were ever part of God's family in any way, the Holy Spirit was actively working on your heart and my heart to bring us to the point where we see our need to accept Jesus Christ as our Savior. Here we have Jesus, and he's speaking of the Holy Spirit in John 16, verse 8, and he says, And when he, the Holy Spirit, and when he has come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. You see, at this point, prior to what we would call salvation or the moment we were saved, God's spirit is not in our lives, but he is simply with us to open up the eyes of our heart, to open up our spiritual eyes to our need of God's salvation for humanity in these three areas, sin, righteousness, and judgment, right? The idea of sin, we're all born in sin. And you might be like, well, that's not fair. It's not. But it's truth. We're all born far from God and separate, be separated because of our sin. And we're born with that. And there's nothing we can do about that on our own. Of righteousness. The fact that no matter how good you think you can be or how good you will live for a certain amount of years does not even come close to the righteousness of God. The word says our righteousness, as good as we can make it, is still but filthy rags compared to the Lord's because there's still sin wrapped around it. And of judgment, the eternal judgment that's coming. And it's coming. You see, and the Holy Spirit is at work. And every person at the grocery store, every person you see walking through the mall, every person that's in the cubicle next to you, or every person that's in the floor that you're working on, every person in your family, every person at every sporting event, the Holy Spirit is working on them to get them to, to see their need for a savior in these three areas. It's only through the working of the Holy Spirit can people become aware of their spiritual need. One of the things I say is an unbeliever or someone that's far from God doesn't walk into a church on Sunday morning because there's nothing else to do. How many of you realize that? Maybe this is a shock for you. <laughs> Maybe you're like, yeah, why am I here? <laughs> it's the Holy Spirit working. It's the Holy Spirit working. For you to come to church, it's, it's, it's the move of God in your life. You have thousands of other things you can be doing, especially with the, the modern technology that we have and YouTube and Facebook and everything else. Uh, there's all kinds of other things. Why are you here? It's because the Holy Spirit is moving actively in your life, right? Maybe you're questioning life. Maybe you're questioning what is life all about? What is faith? You see, that's just not you. That's the Holy Spirit working in your life to open your eyes to the things that you need. Maybe certain Christian songs move you, and I don't know why. Maybe certain messages, you know, get you all knotted up inside, and you don't know why. I know why. Scripture knows why. God knows why. It's because the Holy Spirit is actively at work in your life because he wants you to begin to see the beauty and the majesty of God's salvation and his eternal plan for you in all of humanity. And that's how the Holy Spirit deals with all of us. That's how the Lord deals with us. So the Holy Spirit, he comes to convict us of our sin that separates us from God. In that sin, separating us from God, it makes us spiritually dead, and we have no hope of eternal life. Ephesians 2, 
verses 1 through 5, it says, and you, and you, if you received Christ, he made alive. Who were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the cause, course of this world. According to the prince of the power of the air. And he's talking about demonic strongholds, spiritual forces that aren't of God, or, but the opposite. And then he goes on to say, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. And that spirit is a little less. <laughs> That's not the good one. That's not the Holy Spirit. This is demonic influences, right? So according to the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of dis disobedience. We need to be aware that there, we are constantly being influenced by the spiritual realm, whether good or bad. Right? We have the opportunity. Now, we can't just say, no, I'm not. Yes, you are. <laughs> we like to say, no, I'm not. Don't tell me what to do, what to think. Don't tell me what's going on in my life. I'm not. God is. God is saying, man, there is a constant activity, spiritual activity in your life, and the Holy Spirit is trying to grab a hold of you to awaken you to the beauty and the majesty of Jesus. Yeah, there's other spiritual forces at work where we live in this area that are trying to get us to do otherwise, trying to get us to go farther and farther from God. Who now works in the sons of disobedience. And the next verse says, Among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath just as the others. But God, but God who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. You see, by grace you have been saved. Amen? <laughs> Scripture tells us we are we are born spiritually dead and far from God because of our sin. And we would not know that and we would not recognize how far we are from God without the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit convicts us of our sin. Now, the second thing is the Holy Spirit also convicts us of Christ's righteousness. And our lack of righteousness before God. Romans 3, verse 23 through 26 reads this. For all have sinned. How many is all? <laughs> For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness. Because in his forbearance, God had passed over the sins that were previously committed to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness. That he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith. That's you in Jesus. You see, the Holy Spirit shows our own depravity, our own unrighteousness. How far we really are from God in the light of Christ's perfect holiness in his perfect righteousness. So the Holy Spirit comes to convict us of, of righteousness. And then the Holy Spirit convicts us of judgment. Of judgment. Now, if you were walking around and you had your iPods in, or your Beats, or whatever else you would put in your ears, or for some of you, if you had your big things with the cord hanging down and it was plugged into your Walkman. <laughs> if you had that and you were just listening to some gas music, you know what I mean? It, it was just on fire. And, and you were going to cross the street because nothing was coming. And all of a sudden, you feel this tug on the back of your shirt and it stops you in your tracks. And all of a sudden, <laughs> A truck whizzes by. The person that grabbed you on the back of the shirt, would they be mean? Or is it kindness to grab your shirt like that? Is it meanness that they're 
Or is it kindness? You see, is the Holy Spirit's conviction of judgment meanness? Or is it kindness? You see, unless we repent and turn from our sins, there's no other option but eternal judgment and separation from God. No matter how good of a time you think you're having. Romans 6, verse 23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So the Holy Spirit, what he does is he he grabs the back of your shirt. The Holy Spirit convinces us of the wages of sin, and that's eternal death. He opens our eyes to the revelation that there is something after this life. And I want what God created me for, and that's eternal life with him. I don't want to spend my life in eternal judgment. So the Holy Spirit, he's at work in your life when he's uh, with you to get your eyes open to see that there is judgment coming. Don't walk out in the middle of the street. So prior to the coming of Christ, the work of the Holy Spirit is to convict us of our sin and cause us to see our need of forgiveness and accepting God's substitute for our sins through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, right? We know that we couldn't save ourselves. We couldn't set ourselves free. Actually, the word says God saved humanity by his own right hand. You see, God himself came down, and by his own right hand, he allowed himself to go to the cross, even though he lived a sinless and perfect life. He allowed himself to be treated and die a sinner's death. And he was doing that because he was taking our place. Right? It was through his sacrifice that our righteousness isn't cleaned up. It's through his sacrifice in which he gives us his righteousness in our stead. And this phase of the Holy Spirit's work comes from the Holy Spirit being with us, convicting the world, that's us, of sin, righteousness, and judgment. But once the sinner repents of their sin and accepts Christ as their Savior, the work of the Holy Spirit goes from being with us to now living in us. In us. In John 16, verse 7, it says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. The helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. So let's look at the the work of the Holy Spirit in us. You see, the work of the Holy Spirit in us is sanctification. The work of sanctification. There it is. With the Holy Spirit in us, he begins to deal with our soul. How many know just because Jesus now lives in you and now the Holy Spirit is in us, we're not perfect? Right? Just ask my wife pretty much every day. (laughs) She'll let you know, no, I ain't perfect yet. (laughs) We're not perfect. So the Holy Spirit, when he comes and he lives in us, he comes to deal with our soul with the purpose of bringing the sanctifying work of salvation in our hearts. You see, you are saved. And if you were to step out in the street and get hit by a bus, you would immediately be with the Lord because you are saved. But there's something that the Holy Spirit is doing until then, and he's working out sanctification. He's transforming you on the inside. And he does this by speaking truth to our inner man. And by speaking truth to our inner man, it causes us to confront the areas of weakness and carnality that we still have in us, right? John 14, verses 16 and 17. Jesus says, and I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever, the spirit of truth. Ooh, come on. That was some chills up your spine whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him. You know the Holy Spirit. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. You see, each one of us has a need to rid ourselves of our former life and the old nature 
in order for us to, to encounter the deeper truths of the ways of God. You see, God has a life that, for you that he has, has had in store for you from the very beginning. And Jesus sends the Holy Spirit to reveal truth of his word so that we might come alive to it and begin to deal with the untruths in our heart so that we might dwell in a deeper relationship with God and understand the deeper truths of God's ways. I remember when I first got saved, I liked to drink, and I liked to drink a lot. I, I lived the party life. Probably imagine I didn't get saved yesterday. I got saved when I was 22. And I remember, I remember encountering God, and, and really, I mean, he just, he just rearranged my life instantly. He transformed me almost instantly, but there were still things in my life that I was dealing with, like this fact that I really, really like to drink. And I, I remember I, 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 I was still even saved. I would, I would go out with my friends, and I'd be like, no, I'm not going to drink. You know, I'm going to be an example for Jesus Christ. And then, you know, six pack in, I'm telling them about Jesus, right? And then about a 12 pack in, I'm slurring about how good Jesus is. You see, there were still some things in my life that God had to get under control. And it was the Holy Spirit that came with conviction, revealing through his word, the truth of God's word, that that wasn't the life that God had for me, and nor was it a good example for him. You see, the spirit of truth was in me, and he was at work. Was I perfect? No. But the Holy Spirit is with us to train us to live the life that God has always had for us. I remember sitting on my knees one night, and, and it was a Friday night, early Friday night, and I knew I was going to go out with my friends, and I knew I was, I, I was, I was going to drink, and I didn't want to. And I remember falling on my knees, and I was literally weeping. And I'm like, God, I know I'm going to drink, but I don't want to. God, I know I'm going to drink, but I know you don't want me to. And I remember just being in that conflict and just weeping because I knew the truth of God's word and how God felt about me. And why was, I, why was I on my knees weeping? Was it just because I had some epiphany? Was it because that, you know, somehow I was just a really smart dude? Not at all. It was the work of the Holy Spirit. You see, the Holy Spirit comes to reveal truth to us so that we might deal with the issues in our heart and the carnality of our soul. And God had to take me through a process to get over that. But that is the activity of the Holy Spirit. That's not you just coming up with this stuff on your own. That's the Holy Spirit breaking in with truth. I remember, actually, we were mar I was married. Natasha, we, had, or we were in our house that we're in now. And I, I know Christian was born, uh, our oldest. And I think it was shortly after he was born. I mean, I like to play video games. How many like to play video games? Yeah, a few of us. We need more people in this church that play video games. <laughs> I mean, I still like to play video games. And I, I still do time to time. But I was playing this video game series. How many know like video game series? You know, like uh, Mario, yep. <laughs> you're, you're, you're showing your age there. <laughs> Mario. Uh, yeah, stuff like that. Uh, I can't think right now. Uh, Fallout, I remember Fallout, Call of Duty, stuff like that. Anyways, I was playing a video game series, and I remember I, I had just bought it. It just came out, and I just bought it. And, I mean, games aren't cheap, right? And we were newly married. We hard, had hardly any money, right? I mean, that should have been the first red flag. But anyway, so I went and <laughs> I bought this, you know, $65 game. And, I mean, that's a lot of money, and it was a lot of money to me then, especially. And I remember I would put the game in, and I was playing for a little bit, and all of a sudden I'm, I'm playing, and... and The storyline of this game wasn't good at all. It was kind of nasty, to be honest. There were some disgusting things that were taking place. And what I had never thought of as really bad before, all of a sudden, I was in the middle of this game, and I'm going, oh, man, I can't do this. And I remember I popped the game out, and I took it, and I walked over to the garbage. And I opened it up. And I remember just standing there for a moment because 
man, it was $65. <laughs> and I like the game. You see, there's battle over your eyes. There's a battle for what floods into your mind. Because it affects you. It changes you. I remember sitting there for a moment, and I put the disc in the garbage. That was before you could download stuff. And then I had to reach in and take some yucky stuff and put it on top, because I probably would have reached in and grabbed it again. And if there's stuff on top, I don't, <laughs> I don't touch that stuff. Just ask my wife. With dishes, I'm like, nope. There's stuff on that. <laughs> but why did I do that? Why did I all of a sudden, I, even after walking with God for a season, have this epiphany, this revelation, this understanding that this was going to ruin my life or at least ruin it in a way that God didn't have for me? Was it me just like pfft, having a moment of enlightenment? Or was it the activity of the Holy Spirit? Revealing the truth of his word. You see, the Holy Spirit is in you, and he's in you, and he's active to reveal the truth of who God is and what God says and where he's leading you and what God has for you to change, to combat the soul, your, your soul. The Holy Spirit speaks truth to our heart to convict us for us to open up a life to experience more and more of God. And the truth is, there's nothing better than that. I've had experiences with God that are far greater than any video game can offer. So the Holy Spirit is in us to convict us of truth or to transform our souls with the truth of God's word. But also the Holy Spirit is also in us to transform us, to transform us. Romans 8, 29 reads this, For he foreknew, for whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. You see, as we allow the Holy Spirit to work in us, we begin to experience the deeper measures and deeper levels of God's presence and God's glory in our lives. And when we do that, people begin to notice. I don't know if any of you have really experienced Jesus where he kind of broke into your life and all of a sudden you realize the, the depth of God's love and his, his hope and his mercy and his grace in your life and all of a sudden people around you begin to notice something different about you. It's because there is something different about you. I remember, you know, I remember friends coming home soon after encountering Jesus. They're like, man, you've changed. There's something different about you. What's going on in your life? Because it was a good thing. I remember shortly after I got saved, I had an old girlfriend call me up, and she's like, man, you've changed. And I never heard from her again. <laughs> you see, I changed and began to walk out a life that the Holy Spirit had for me, not the world. I was being transformed and people noticed. I remember I bumped into a, an old teacher of mine from high school several years after I was, I was saved. And it's actually at the lumber yard. And I bumped into him. And like, hey, how you doing? He's like, hey, what you doing now? And I'm like, well, I'm a pastor. And he's like, you're a pastor? And I said, yeah, because he knew the life I lived. He was like, oh, my goodness. But notice he says, well, you don't preach, do you? <laughs> I'm like, what do you mean I don't preach? He's like, well, you were really bad at speaking in front of people. And I says, well, I do preach, actually. And he, he was flabbergasted, which opened the door. You see, I encountered someone, and his name is Jesus, and he transforms the human life. He breaks in and goes deep into the recesses of the human heart, and he calls out the very things that he's called them into. That's the transforming power of God, and people notice he left our conversation flabbergasted that I simply would be able to stand in front of people like this today and share the truth of God's word. See, that's the transforming power 
of God. You see, the work of transformation by the Holy Spirit becomes evident to others around us. You remember the apostles, Jesus had gone and he's sitting at the right hand of the Father and they're left to kind of begin this ministry that God launches them into with the power of the Holy Spirit, right? And these apostles are standing before the religious leaders of the day and what did they recognize? The word says they recognized that these were, they had been with Jesus. He's like, these guys, these are just fishermen and shepherds and tax collectors. There's something different about them. They said, man, they look like they've been with Jesus. You see, the Holy Spirit is in us to transform us so that we begin to live a life that looks like we've been with Jesus. And if you're living life right now and it doesn't look like you've spent any time with Jesus in any way, you need to rethink, right? You need to rethink the amount of time that you're spending with Jesus. Because when the Holy Spirit is in us, one of his primary jobs is to transform us. 2 Corinthians 3, verses 17 and 18 says, Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. We can get our worship team up here. We're going to wrap it up. Another part of the work of sanctification that the Holy Spirit does within us is he seals us. Amen to that. Ephesians 4.30 says, And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. See, the Holy Spirit has committed himself to complete the work of sanctification in your life, and you're sealed to God by him. You see, in the light of the coming judgment, the work of, the work of sanctification by the Holy Spirit brings us great assurance of our acceptance in Christ until the very end. And we can have faith and assurance in that. Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 1, right, he says, you who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. You see, God claims us as his own, and he secures us from the coming judgment that the world and the unbeliever are going to be facing. And that sealing is done by the Holy Spirit in us. It's the work of salvation by the Holy Spirit in us. By the Holy Spirit being in us, we become a new creation. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. He re regenerates us. Regeneration takes place in our lives. Titus 3, 5. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done. But according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. We're reconciled, Romans 5.10. For if we, when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. We are adopted into the family of God, Romans 8.15. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. Oh, this God that was far from me. All of a sudden, with the Holy Spirit in me, I fall on my knees and say, Oh, Abba, Father. Father, I know you love me. I know you have plans for me. I know you won't leave me in the pit of despair. But God, you're with me. Abba, Father. And that's all done by the Holy Spirit in us. All of this is the work of salvation by the Holy Spirit in us. Having the Spirit of God make his home in us. That's the person of the Holy Spirit. And he strives with us to get us to yield to his leadership and be Lord of our lives. And we submit and we say, Jesus, I receive your salvation. He then comes in us and produces the character of Christ in us. And then he also seeks to fill us 
with his power by coming upon us. Next week, we'll be talking about the Holy Spirit upon us. He's so good. You're not alone. When you received Jesus, it wasn't just a ticket being punched. He said, there's another, just as I am, who is God. He's part of the Trinity, and I'm going to give him to you. He's the promise of the Father. He's the helper. He's the comforter. He'll lead you in the ways of truth. He'll give you what you ought to say when you need it. And when you turn to him, you'll find him. And when you need the power of God in your life, it's through the Holy Spirit coming upon you. Can't wait. Let's stand. Jesus. Including you guys online. I want to kind of end with this question. What phase are you in with the person of the Holy Spirit? What phase are you in with the Holy Spirit? Is he with you? Is he in you? Is he upon you? And I want you to just take a moment, recognize where you're at, and it's okay, where you are. But it's also good to realize where I am in the phases of the Holy Spirit in my life. If you recognize that you're still in that phase with the Holy Spirit, is with you. You recognize that, man, God's doing something in my life, but I really haven't surrendered all. I haven't given him everything. I haven't understood that, man, I am so broken and I can't unbreak myself and I need a savior and his name is Jesus. And because God loved me so much, he sent his only begotten son to set me free from the bondage of sin and brokenness and that I might have wholeness of life the life that I was created for from the very beginning and that is God with me and in me. That I live a life that's walking with God. Not far from God, but with God. Never alone, but living the divine destiny that God has for me. And if that's you this morning and you're like, man, I I want that in my life, but I've I've never looked to God for the forgiveness of my sins. I've never asked him, or maybe I did when I was a, a little kid or a long time ago. But I've since walked away from God, and today I want that back. Here's your opportunity this morning to recognize that God is with you and that God is actively opening your eyes to the revelation of who he is and the beauty of his majesty and that he longs to come and set you free and make his home in you and all you have to do is receive it. You have to get your hands up like we said earlier and say, God, I surrender. God, I surrender. I receive forgiveness of my sins. I recognize that I need a savior and I receive your salvation, Jesus. So God, I surrender everything and I promise to to follow you, Jesus, all the days of my life. And today I choose to receive the person of the Holy Spirit inside me. If that's you and you say that prayer with all your heart, with hands raised, God hears, God sees, and God washes you, and God cleanses you, God fills you with his Holy Spirit. And from this moment on, in your prayer life, whether it's here or at home or wherever you might be, you can look up to God and say, have a father. <laughs> You're my dad. And I'll follow you all the days of my life. Help me be with me. Give me wisdom and understanding. Help me through the situations that I'm in. See, that's, that's being saved. 
You don't have to fear eternal judgment because His Spirit now seals you with salvation in the love of God. If that's you, man, I promise you, when you prayed that prayer, God has heard it, and God has responded, and God has filled you with his presence, and you can leave this place knowing that God is your father. Amen. Or maybe you're recognizing that the Spirit of God is in you, and he's dealing with some things, and you need to surrender. God, I listen to the truth of your word. I'm listening to the truth of your Holy Spirit. I recognize there's an activity going on that's calling me out of my carnality, calling me out of uh, the sinful pleasures that this world might offer so that I might be one that's dedicated to you, God. That That me, that I would become a Nazarite unto the Lord, one that is dedicated unto the Lord holy. And that's the invitation that Jesus gave. He said, come to me, all you heavy laden, for my burden is light. (laughs) Holy Spirit, we say yes. We say yes to letting go of the unforgiveness we've been holding. We say yes to letting go of the anger that we've been striving with. God, we say yes to choosing purity over lusts and immorality. God, we say yes to the indwelling spirit that's convicting us to to lay more and more of our lives down that our souls might be transformed into the the person that you created from the very beginning to walk with God. Just say yes to him. Say yes to the Holy Spirit within you. And God, we look forward to looking at next week, the Holy Spirit upon us. For you did not leave us frail, but you've given us the spirit of power to live the life that you've called us to live. Help us recognize you, Holy Spirit. Help us recognize the advocate, the comforter, the person of the Holy Spirit. Lord, I pray as we leave this place that we would encounter you still more and more. God, that you would awaken us to the revelation of the Holy Spirit with us and in us and even upon us. God, let us leave this place different than when we came in, all because of you, Holy Spirit. Bless us as we go. And continue to move in our lives. And give us the grace to recognize it throughout this week. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Praise the Lord. Next week we'll be looking at the Holy Spirit upon us. If you need any, if you need prayer, uh, I'm going to be available here uh, in front of the stage after our worship team is done. Uh, I would love to pray with you or, or stand with you in prayer, whatever it might be. Maybe you need healing. Maybe you're dealing with some circumstances or sickness. Or maybe you just received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. I'd love to hear from you and pray with you in the best decision you ever made. But I'm going to be available for prayer. And remember, as we go, you only have one life to live. Live it for Jesus, and you will never, ever be disappointed. Amen. God bless. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Soon.